Good morning. Good morning. How many of you have seen God answer prayers in your life? Amen. Okay, if you haven't seen God answer prayers in your life, you're either not praying or you're not watching. Um, you know, we uh, got into June and no rain, high heat. Everybody's talking about, oh, fire season, fire season, it's going to be horrible. And we started praying in June in our prayer meeting here on Wednesday nights. God, even the lightning obeys your command. God, we're asking that you would spare us a horrible fire season. Bring the weather down, Father. Cool it down. If it be your will, this is what we're asking. And I'll tell you what, this does not feel like July to me. Thank God. <laughs> Where'd she go? She left. I was going to introduce Cindy, who was going to stand up and share a little bit about what was going on in Belize, because coming from Belize, this feels like winter. But she ditched me. She told me she didn't like speaking in front of people. So I'm going to put Leanne on the spot. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Um, I started off this week with grandiose plans. Uh, man, Saturday, I, I'd been planning all week for Saturday. Man, I had that laid out. I knew what I was doing. Got up Saturday morning, and I just knew, man, I'm going to minister today. I got, I got opportunities. Nothing, not one thing went according to plan. Not one. And I got to confess, I went to bed last night. I was very frustrated. I felt like I had missed opportunities, I, I hadn't planned my day right, I hadn't taken things into account, this and that and the other thing, and, and I was really frustrated, and we were getting ready for bed, and, and Christy said, well, what, what's wrong? And I told her, I said, I'm frustrated, I planned all week for Saturday, and I had my heart geared, I was prayed up, I knew God was going to give me things to say, and I didn't get to talk to anyone. That's why I you don't plan. <laughs> 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 I gotta regather myself. <laughs> this is why God put people like TJ in my life <laughs> and gave me a wife that loves spontaneity. Poor Christy. <laughs> I told you last week, I plan my spontaneity. Now, see, the trick is if you don't know what I'm gonna do, it's spontaneous to you. Okay? Um, but I was really frustrated last night, and I shared with Christy, and I said, you know, I just, I knew these things that I just had set in my mind what was going to happen, what it was going to look like, how it was going to go, and it didn't go anything like what I wanted. And she started pointing out to me the things that I had done throughout the day where I, I've got my mind focused over here, but God has me actually working over here, and I'm totally oblivious to it because I'm looking over there going, God, I was supposed to do this. And she started sharing with me things that I had done throughout the day, and and I, I have to tell you, I, Christy is an encourager. I'm an exhorter, Christy's an encourager. Okay? You need a kick in the behind, come to me. You need a pat on the back, go to her. But I really try hard to pat people on the back, but it always ends up being a kick in the behind. And I don't know how that works. My poor kids. I, I see they're having a down day, and I'm a man, I'm going to encourage them, I'm going to build them up, I'm going to motivate them. See, i got to leave the motivating out, I guess. <laughs> And, and the kids always walk away from my encouraging speeches like this. <laughs> okay, but I, I guess I want to share with you. I had spent so much time building up in my mind what I knew God wanted to do that I completely forgot to ask God what he would have me do. I mean, everything that I had planned, I, I knew was godly. I knew it was just, I knew it was right, it was, it, it was according to his word, but it wasn't what he wanted that day. And so I, I just want to encourage you, now that, 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 maybe I should have Christy do this part. <laughs> Don't let your, pan, your plans interfere with God's plans. Okay? Very much kind of what TJ said. 
you got to be flexible. You got to let God say, you know what? No, we're not going to do that today. We're going to do this, and and be willing to do it with all your heart. Okay. Um, I guess Cindy's gone for good. Okay. Well, just that's okay. We'll do it after. We'll, I'll give her a chance after. Um, so for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Cindy and Leanne Kidder are here. Leanne is moving back. She is going to be starting at the Job Corps here pretty quick. Uh, she is done with high school, and I won't tell you what she wants to do. I'll let her tell you what she wants to do one-on-one, because -on -one, she doesn't speak in front of crowds. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's fair. I don't speak in front of crowds either. But um, Cindy is actually leaving Tuesday? Wow. Okay, because you guys told me Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then you read, read. Okay, but they are here to visit. These are our missionaries, or part of our missionaries, to Belize. Yes, yes come in. Because you put me on the spot. I said, and here's Cindy not. <laughs> you can't scoot in, though, because it's your turn. Oh, really? Yes. I have nothing to say now. <laughs> Okay, so, so this is my family, sorry. They were a little lost. <laughs> so Cindy and Mike and their children are missionaries from this church to Belize. And um, we talked a little bit last week about Mike's ideas, his plans. He was gonna go down and be a mechanic and fix things and be behind the scenes. And I told him before he left, I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, that Mike, but I think God's gonna use you to speak to people. And I'm gonna let you share what Mike's doing right now. Um, right now we're working on um, you might as well call it a church plant because we have three ladies. Um, so we're basically planning a church in the community. So um, lots of struggles, lots of opposition. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, one thing I forgot to tell you. She doesn't like to do prepared things, so she wants questions and answers. Yes, please. So if you guys ask her a question, she'll feel a whole please. lot more comfortable asking you <laughs> or answering it. Okay. What island? Um, Belize is actually not an island. Belize is um, in Central America. It's just south of the Yucatan. I don't that. I think that we're we're it, we're mainland. There's islands. There's, you know, we're not in the Keys. We don't live on the the Keys. Okay, so you're just living in the city of Belize. Um, we're just south of the city. South or southwest. What's the name of the town? Um, it's a new community called Eight Mile. Um, it's also called Western Paradise. Um, there's about five thousand people there for a new community. That's yeah. So tell us what Mike is doing right now. Right now, Mike should be delivering his message. And Ashley should be doing Sunday school, so keep him in your prayers. Because <laughs> she's 14 and you know this is brand new to her. <laughs> and it's Sunday school for us is one room. And so you have anywhere from six months old is our youngest to 12 years. And in some weeks it's only 10. Some weeks it's 30. What's the biggest resistance you're facing? Um, a lot of religion, not a lot of love. Okay, one thing that I can share with you because I, I was there two years ago, okay. and I got to really meet a lot of families. I did go as a missionary, yep. but I just went as a guest in this okay. family. Uh, one thing that I, uh, the Lord showed me, and it, I still have some effects to that, um, one of the biggest resistance is, is because if you learn about their, this, where these people came and their background, yeah, a lot of it is uh, witchcraft. Uh, yeah, that really OBS is what they call it, yes. Yeah, because that's what it is, comes down to, because I saw it, I was around it, just into their festivities, so I learned that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that the brethren here need to really, really go into prayer break that because that's one of the biggest oppositions that I saw there. Yes. It is very dark. Belize is very dark. Mm -hmm. It's supposedly a Christian nation, but it's not. Um, no. Well, they, they, they do. Uh, this is what I saw. They this on how to little. Uh, what I saw is that, okay, they do read the Bible, they're but, they're, but they're, um, there's also uh, something else that I'll share with you later. Um, there's uh, 
uh, how can I say, the tradition that comes so deep from way back, from years and years back, I, they carry that in their heart. I don't know if you, you said you were there. I lived in the small um, village of uh, Manatee or Gales Point. It's the original village that the slaves actually, um, when they escaped, they would actually take the, um, the river down to this village and that's how the village started. Um, I know a lot about their culture, a lot about their history. Um, I know how to bake on the fire hearth. I know, yeah. Um, yeah, but that's that's one of the biggest opposition that. Uh, you're right. That's why I said that they're they're really scripturally knowledgeable, but it's they can't let go of that. They don't have a relationship. That's why I said it's it's very. The, that's why I said religion is the biggest opposition because they're very religious, but not they don't have that relationship with Jesus like they should. Uh, does it have like an official religion, like, or is it predominantly Catholic, or what's? Um, like? there's not an official. It's it's very. There's a lot of. Um, you've got everything there. Um, there there is a lot of Catholicism. I mean, it was Britain. Um, it was a British colony. Um, it's a Commonwealth country. So there is a lot of that that you have there. A lot of the schools there are Catholic. In fact, the better schools are Catholic. How many regular attendees do you have? Um, right now we've got about, well, depends. How many do you want to count? Because I can't count, I usually don't count my family, because that's nine of us, right? <laughs> um, and they, my family needs a lot of prayers. Um, the young girls are going through, and my kids are going through a lot. They've got a lot of baggage, um, and most of the kids in the country do. Um, but, um, so our foster kids lift us up in prayer. Um, we have, Three ladies that are regular attenders. We've got a, um, a couple that's also um, part of the Brethren. Um, they're from another church that are alongside us. Um, and then um, I, I'm older gentleman. That's, that's our group. And then we have, like I said, anywhere. Then you talk to kids. We've got anywhere from, you know, 10 to 30. And then they fluctuate. There's a lot of... There's a lot of Americans who go down there and do teams, and there's, um, so there's that. So we lose a lot of our numbers if somebody's going down there and they're giving away stuff. Because, um, well, free stuff, you know? Yeah. Talk to the show a little bit about how that's affected the, the mentality down there. Uh, well, they were already, they're already in a victim mentality anyway, because they were slaves. Um, a lot of them, not the Spanish, but, so they have a victim mentality, and so, they view it if you're not a, if you're not giving as a Christian, you must not be a Christian. If I don't stop and pick you up on the side of the road while I'm going to town, even if my car is overflowing and we're bottomed out, I must not be a Christian. <laughs> um, but the giving and the giving and the giving, the problem with the giving is it just creates more world. They they have what they need. Nobody's starving. Um, and what those that are starving, it's because of um, oppression, um, it's control. Um, a lot of kids go hungry, and it's not because there isn't the money for the food or the venues for the food, it's because the parents are neglectful and not, yeah. So nobody's hungry, there's food everywhere. It, you can find it everywhere. Um, in fact, obesity is a huge problem, and so is type two diabetes. Um, so the handouts, what it does is it creates this give me, give me attitude. And that's not how, what they need is the gospel. They don't need the handouts. So what does your um, kind of outreach look like then? You can have your church services. You know, we, we, we have church services. Um, I'm, I, I believe in relationship, relational discipleship. Um, so I've got three young gals that I'm, or well, one of them's not so young. She's actually older than I am. But I have three gals that I'm, um, sorry, ladies that I am um, mentoring and discipling. Um, and then I have a ladies group and things like that. And um, we're working on training them to reach their own people because they will reach their own people far better than we will. that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Mike's, Mike Lentz leads a men's group of about 20 and is actually not from one church. It's actually several denominations and several churches that come and meet together. And they're from 13 to 35. 
and he's just training them how to be leaders and what God expects from them as men in the church. What are your facilities like? Um, the facilities, the, the, the church that we're working out of right now was, was a one bedroom, one bath house um, that they basically took the bedroom out of. Concrete structure that they basically just gutted and put pews in. And then we have an external building that we do Sunday school in, um, which is just the roof. It's, it works. As long as the weather cooperates and it's, the rain isn't going sideways, we're good. <laughs> um, facilities, I mean, it's Belize. I believe the church is the body, so facilities, I don't know. They do need, they're in malrepair, but that's Belize. <laughs> If your roof doesn't leak, you're not a, you, you don't have a Belizean home. Um, <laughs> any other questions, thoughts? How's the church at Guest Point doing? Do you guys hear from often? Um, Kenny's struggling. Pray for him a lot. Um, a lot of his men have dropped off. Um, and so we're praying for them, trying to encourage them. Um, the ladies are still strong. They just did their, I don't know if you get any updates from them. They just did a mission trip to Guatemala, which was really eye-opening for them. Because, like I said, well, they've, they've had almost 20 years of missionaries just coming and giving and giving and giving. Well, they've got this attitude that, look at me, I'm poor. Give me, give me, give me. Well, they went to Guatemala and saw people who lived 10 times, you know, 100 times worse than them. The, the, the situation that they were living was so hard for the ladies that went and the men that went that they couldn't continue to enter homes to pray for the families. No. So they got a real eye awakening that, hey, we don't really have it that bad. Because we go down there and we live in our nice comfortable homes with our air conditioning and our TVs and you look at their house and then you say, oh man, it's so horrible. But really, you know, they have no rent, you know, they have no bills. So... What we think is horrible is normal life for them. And so when you go, you have to come with that attitude. If you go to another place, remember that this is normal life. Like I said, most people cook on fire, but then you don't have to pay for butane. The church is struggling. The youth are really out of control. Great for them. They, 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 they have a struggle. It, our original village, um, Gales Point, is um, also um, very highly associated with the George Street Gang, which is in the city. Um, in fact, this, the government likes to send, when the gang gets too out of control, the government likes to pay them to go to the village, and so they recruit straight directly from the village. So besides the witchcraft and the, the everything else that they're dealing with, the, the voodoo, the hoodoo, um, the obia is what they call it, um, which is black magic. Um, and um, so they, the kids are fighting against the world, the gang, and this, all at the same time while trying to walk out their faith. Because there are several that are trying, but it's, they've got a lot of pulls. Any of, I'm, I'm good. Pray for us, we've, we've really had a lot of opposition with our family. Um, our girls have a lot of the, you live the, with the white people, how can you man? Yeah, racism is bad down there. If you're not giving them something as a white person, you're of no value. <laughs> so I, I get to see the other side of it, right? The other side of racism. Mm -hmm. um, we took Leanne to the clinic, and we were told to stand off to the side, and they helped everybody else before they helped us. Because, you know, we're white. And we, they're putting us in our place. Um, but our girls hear it all the time at school. And they're happy to be where they are, but then you hear constantly from your friends, how can you manage living with them? Um, one of them came and misconception because, you know, their, their mom saw a white, white lady and she's, she's mixed. I mean, they're, they're, they're half Spanish, half Creole. And so they, they said, oh, your mom must have AIDS. So that went around the school too because they assume that they're my child and that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's gossip, it happens everywhere. But yes, please. 
I was, I was really blessed to go to, uh, where were you? Oh gosh, I can't remember the, the name of the city right now, but you know, I saw the opposite there. Where were you? Were um, you in a Spanish culture or? No, it's, it's, it's uh, African American. Um, but I saw that the opposite, the people were so open to hear the word. The children were, I mean, I came out of there. I'm shocked because the people were so kind and they opened the door. They doors. are very welcoming. They're a very and open culture. But, they, but they're, they're, the way they behave, their behavior, I mean, I came out of there crying that I could not believe our kids don't do that here to be respectful or to help others or to wish. Share. Something. They share amazingly. And, and I would They're not greedy. How these children were raised in. Not only children, but men. Men cleaning toilets, men sweeping, men. I mean, this was. Not the same, not the same place I've been. That's why I said. <laughs> each, I was going to say. It's, each section of that why I said I went each, to Each place. Places. Well, there's so many different communities. Yes. Because um, I know missionaries who work with um, the Mayans and things like that. And the kids are so different and the people are so different. You actually see in the community we're in now, families go on family bike rides and things like that, which we wouldn't have seen in the previous village. And maybe this is because it's a bigger, a bigger town than where I went to. Uh, I mean, they're just so, um, where I went, they're just so humble. Uh, humble. I, yeah, I, I know most of the country, but you can tell me later. We'll, we'll talk later. <laughs> but going for two weeks, because we went down, for a few weeks before we went, and being there for a few weeks is way different than being there full time. Yes. Okay. So, in your prayer journals, actually on the back of your bulletins, there's a place to put notes. Put down, put it somewhere in your house where you'll see it. Pray for the kidders. Okay. Now, Cindy didn't cover all of the things that they're doing. Uh, the fact that they've opened their house to four more children who come from a horrific background. And they are trying to integrate them into their family. And, and these kids that really had no rules before are, are not liking the fact that there are rules. And Mike and Cindy and Leanne and uh, Ashley and Nick, they, they have welcomed them in. They've made them a part of the family, and it's a struggle. But that's just a minor part of what they're doing down there. Um, the religion, the religiosity that is there is insane. Unfortunately, I don't think it's a whole lot different than what we have here. People that know what they're doing because they've read the Bible, they have a form of godliness but have denied its power. So keep Mike and Cindy and their family very much in your prayers. Um, Cindy touched on the facilities. Um, actually, this Thursday at the Brothers Meeting, which, by the way, this Thursday is Brothers Meeting, uh, we're going to talk about putting a team together to go down and help them do some of the repair work on their building. But beyond that, I want to go down and encourage Mike and Cindy and, and be a blessing to them and be able to just fellowship with them and pray with them and undergird them in the work that they're doing. Okay? So uh, that's something that's in the works. We'll talk about that more on Thursday. Um, at the brothers meeting. So keep them very much in your prayers. And you're, you're heading out tomorrow, right? Home tomorrow, but Leanne is staying, so pray for her. Yes. Yep. And uh, Leanne knows she's always welcome down here. Okay. Open up your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 6. We have been working through spiritual warfare. We've talked about knowing our enemy, knowing ourselves, and knowing the ground. So, who's our enemy? Satan. 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 Who else is our enemy? Us. Ourselves. Who else is our enemy? The world. the world. So, we've got the devil against us. We've got the world against us. And oftentimes we have our own flesh against us. Okay? And when you look at just that part of it, it's overwhelming sometimes. How can we hope to accomplish anything? You can't. Okay? You can't. But 
There's that marvelous word for Christians, but. Okay? Let's look at what God's word says. Verse 10, chapter 6 of Ephesians. Paul is concluding his letter to this church. And he says, finally, after everything that I've said, this is what I want to get to. Finally, take note. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, now think about this for a moment. You have this vast array of an enemy host set against you. You have God for you. Which side do you want to be on? Yeah, because we oftentimes get so caught up in looking at what's arrayed against us, we forget the God that sustains us. Amen. The God that walks with us. The God that gives us strength, not of our own, but of His, to fight the battle that He's already won. Well, why fight it? Because He said so. Okay? So be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. All of it. Not just parts of it. Why? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Okay? So... This, this battle is not being waged in this realm here. We will see the effects of it in this realm. But the battle is being waged in the spiritual realm. Okay? And just, just a heads up. You don't believe in the spiritual realm? Great. The devil's thrilled. He can do whatever he wants with you because you don't think he exists. He'll even allow you to think you're the one in control. But God's word says you have one of two choices. You can serve as a slave to sin under the authority and the power of the prince of this world. That's where everybody is except those who believe and are accounted the children of God then you willingly become a bondservant. You cast off the fetters of sin and you embrace God. And that's your choice. You can choose the devil as your master. I ain't serving the devil, I serve myself. Thank you, you just proved my point. Or you can serve God. Okay? <coughs> Verse 13, therefore, what is the therefore, therefore? Okay, if you start a verse and it says therefore, you got to back up and understand why that's there. Okay, because our battle is against spiritual forces and being waged in a spiritual realm, because of this, take up, again, he reiterates, the whole armor of God. Now, everything in this book is important. Amen. But when the author, who is God, inspires the writer, who in this case is Paul, to reiterate something, pay attention. Okay? He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand or withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Now, put your mental finger right there on stand firm. We're going to come back to that. Okay? Keep that in your mind. Verse 14. Stand therefore... Hmm. Another reiteration. Having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness... And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. 
and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, backing up, in verse 14, we have talked about thus far the belt of truth. And I told you, my, my personal opinion is that Paul is not referring specifically to this in this case. Now, this is truth, but I believe that Paul is saying something else because a little bit further down, he tells us to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay? I don't think Paul is being redundant in this case. I think Paul is talking about sincerity in who you are. Don't walk like a Christian or talk like a Christian or look like a Christian. Be a Christian. Amen. Okay? Don't put on the mask when you come in those doors that you take off when you walk out. Don't live a multiple personality life. You're this way in front of me or in front of people that you know are Christians, but boy, when you get out amongst people that you don't know are Christians, well, you're a different person. Be sincere in who you are at all times. Okay? Gird about your loins the belt of truth. And I told you that a Roman soldier, now Paul's writing this in prison. He is being guarded day and night by a Roman soldier. Okay? So when he's giving us this list, he's just looking at this guy going, yeah, you need about your, your waist, about your groin, the belt of truth. And it's not a belt like this. It's something that covers and protects. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the, the breastplate that he's talking about, the Romans called a heart guard. Okay? What guards your heart protects you against the lies of the enemy. It is a righteousness that is not your own. It's God's. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become what? What? The righteousness of God. So when, when you're standing before God, He sees you with His righteousness. Do you make mistakes? Yup. Do you sin? Yup. If you ever think you don't, you're a liar. You just sinned again. Okay? First John makes it very clear. We all sin. That's the incredible, miraculous thing about God's grace. When Jesus went to the cross on my behalf, on your behalf, all sin was paid for. When he said it is done, he didn't say to be continued. He said it is finished, it is accomplished. The debt is paid, there is nothing owing. So the righteousness that you have is not because you act holy. It's because you are holy. God has made you holy. Amen. What used to mark your life that you were called a sinner has been washed away, has been buried, you've been resurrected in new life. That is the righteousness of God in Christ. Okay? That guards your heart. That protects you. Today, we're going to talk about, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Wow. There's a lot right here. Now, the first thing we need to understand this is not what he's talking about. Okay? Because the Roman soldier standing there was not wearing loafers. 
Josh, could you put the picture up for me, please? This is what the Roman soldiers would wear. You see the hobnails in the bottom of the shoe? They're like cleats. They're put there for a purpose. What do you suppose that is? Traction. traction. Why do you suppose they needed traction? I mean, think about this for a minute. This is an army that marches miles and miles and miles. That's not comfortable to march in. But this is what they're wearing. So why are they wearing this? What is the only purpose that they need these shoes for? Battle. Battle. This is every bit as much a part of his armor as the breastplate. Because he has got to know his footing is secure. When he stands in line and they are impacted by the enemy or they are impacting the enemy, they've got to be the ones that can stand. Okay? Now, how does that translate to us? Because Paul is saying, have your feet shod, put these shoes on your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. What, what does that mean? Well, when do you wear shoes? You wear shoes to bed? No. Well, some of you might. I don't know. <laughs> Keep your sleeping habits right. All right. You wear shoes to bed. I don't want to know. About it. All right. Now, I know in Montana. Okay, I grew up in a place where shoes were on your feet from the time you got up in the morning till the time you went to bed. I come to Montana and I walk in the door and there's piles of shoes. It's like. Well, did you explode your kids or what? <laughs> Everybody's shoes in there. I mean, you walk in the door and people are like, take off your shoes. But that was as strange to me as you walk in my door and I say, take off your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want my shoes? Take off my shoes. Bare feet, my sock feet. I mean, sock feet to me, you see somebody in sock feet, that was like seeing somebody in their underwear. <laughs> okay, and a lot of people up north do that, which makes no sense to me at all. You think people in the hot climates would do that, but no, it's the people in the cold climates. Take off your shoes. Okay, what do you wear your shoes for? Going out, not for staying in, especially not in Montana. By the way, if you come to my house, take your shoes off, leave your shoes on. Put one on your hand, I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. You put your shoes wherever you're comfortable, okay? Um, it doesn't matter to me. So, what, what is Paul talking about here? We need to be ready. Ready with what? Well, what does he say? Ooh, yeah. Putting on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Do you understand the way this is phrased? Is that you should already be ready? This is something that you shouldn't have to go, oh wait, time out, let me put my shoes on. I mean, you don't run to battle barefoot and then try and put your shoes on in the midst of the battle. Okay? You have your shoes on so that when the battle comes, you're prepared. So, what is this readiness given by the gospel of peace? Well, first, what is the gospel? Well, yeah, the gospel is good news, but what's the good news? Good news, I had a baby born this last week. My grandbaby, excuse me, not my baby. Please don't look at Christy. Okay, that's good news. But is it the gospel? So what is the gospel? Let it, let's break it down to its simplest form. People are lost and held back. God has made a way that they can be heaven bound. Okay? That's the gospel in its simplest form. Now, how do you go from one to the other? Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10. We are saved 
by grace, through faith, not of works that anyone would boast. Okay? We, we, we don't do anything in the salvation part but go, okay, I take it. God, you paid my bill. Thank you. Okay? Now, becoming a Christian is that easy. Being a Christian means giving up your life. Giving up all the rights that you think you have to do the things that you want to do in exchange for the things that God wants you to do. And just so you know, he's got better plans than you. Okay? Just, just so you're aware of that. Uh, people that think, oh, you're a Christian, you'd be a Christian, you've got to give up all the fun stuff. This was fun stuff when I was in high school. This is what my friends did. I did not do this. Okay? This is not testimony time for Glenn. Okay? <laughs> Every Friday, there would be a party. I never even went to one of these. So I, I know because I saw them Saturday. <laughs> and they would drink as much of any kind of alcohol as they could find until they acted like idiots, which wasn't a big change from before. <clears throat> it was high school. And they got sick. And they threw up. And then come Monday, they talked about what a great time they had Friday. You could not move all day Saturday. But this is your plans for your life. This is what you want. This is, this is your plans. Well, not everybody does that. No, man, I, man, I worked hard. I'm, I'm going to earn my million bucks before I'm 30. Really? And what's that going to buy you? Take a little look. If you're interested in what the pursuit of money brings, take a little look at the end of the life of all the great millionaires in this country. Go, go back and take a look at some of these men. What they looked at at the end of their life, what they said. Okay? There's not a one of them that said that money brought them happiness. Yeah, they could have anything they wanted, but it didn't make them happy. John Rockefeller didn't make him happy. He said, I was happier when I was working down in the train yards. Money just made me have more things to worry about. Okay? Well, I'm not going to pursue money. I'm not going to waste my life with alcohol. Well, what are you going to spend your life doing? Look, every person is created uniquely by God to need God. Everybody has a drive, a longing, a wanting for something. Everybody has innate in them faith in something. You don't think the atheists have a God? They like to go by atheist, no God, and think that that's, you have a God. You have become your own God. Your ability to do what? Please, create something out of nothing for me. Please. Please, just for one hour, give me peace in my heart. Go. Okay? They have exchanged the immortal God for something clothed in flesh. Or let's, let's even go beyond that. How about intellect? Let's, let's use our intellect because without God, that's all you got. Now, I don't care how far up there your IQ is. You're stupid. Okay? If you can grab that real quick, your, your relationship with God will go so much better. Okay? Because God is the one that designed you, put you together, built you, and understands how you work best. Okay? For example, my own life, I'm a diabetic. And people go, oh, God didn't give you that. Sure he did. God allowed that in my life. God allowed that in my life. I don't know why God allowed it in my life, but if I think Satan has that much more power over my life than God does, then I'm serving the wrong God, right? So if God has allowed it in my life, why has he allowed it in my life? Well, I can think of a couple things that have come out of that. One, I can relate to a certain group of people a whole lot better than those of you that are not diabetics can. But if my intellect, being so superior, 
I want to do things my way, which for years and years and years I did. I was diagnosed at nine years old. And I, man, I had no desire. Who wants to stick themselves with a the needle? I'm sorry, people that do drugs like that, you're, you're wild. You're nuts. Okay? And then, because when I started off, there was no testing blood. There were no home kits to test your blood. You had to test your urine. Oh, yippee. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, I got to go test my pee. <laughs> that just brings all the friends around you. <laughs> oh, it's time to eat. You need to go check. What are you doing? I, I got to do, I got to go. I'll be back. But for years, I fought and fought and fought against the reality of what was. The reality of what was was I was a diabetic. And I needed to take insulin, and I needed to monitor my sugars, and I needed to correct my diet, and I needed to exercise. I needed to do things that in my intellect and my desire, I really didn't have a lot of interest in doing. Quite honestly, there's not a whole lot of vegetables that I look at and go, oh, I choose that over anything. <laughs> Okay? There's, there's not many of them. I, a lot of fruit I could do, but vegetables, I just look at them and go, oh, that must be part of the curse. Because <laughs> when we get to heaven, I know that all, all that stuff's going to taste good. But I, you know my belief. I don't believe there's going to be onions in heaven. Okay? All right? Those are going down in the earth where they belong. Okay, so... The gospel. What is the gospel? We've shared that it is an understanding that you are separated from God. It is an understanding that once you grasp hold of that, God has made a way for you to be reunited with him or united with him. That there is freedom in Christ that you will never experience outside of him. Okay? Okay? But where does that leave us? What are we, we're supposed to be ready with this. So I'm ready with the gospel for who? For my sake? I've already received the gospel. Well, what are we supposed to do with the gospel? Come on, people. Share the truth. You share it. Look, I, 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 you hear this all the time. I'm not an evangelist. No, you're a witness. Okay? There are people that are gifted with evangelism. And they, they have an outreach ministry. I see you shaking your head, but you are. <laughs> you are. Okay? There are people that have a gift that takes their witness and explodes it over everybody that's around them. There are the rest of us that are witnesses, first in how we live. How many of you heard the phrase, preach always, if necessary, use words. That's garbage. Okay. First, they say Francis of Assisi, he never said that. Okay. That didn't appear until some 600 years after he died. Nobody that knew him ever penned that he said that. Okay. What he did say is that the testimony of your life should always back up the testimony of your mouth. But look, the gospel is not something that you just act out. There are no pantomimes as witnesses for Christ. <laughs> that, that don't go, all right? The gospel is delivered by speaking, all right? So let's, let's take a look at a couple scriptures here. Matthew 28, it's on the front of your uh, bulletin. Starting in uh, 16. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 16. Uh, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. <clears throat> Anybody been there? Anybody ever dealt with doubt? Okay. Some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what is he establishing right there in that line? He's the boss. 
Okay? He's telling them, I'm the boss. Go, therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Because he's the boss and he's telling us, go. And that word in the Greek does not mean like get up and go. It's an active tense. You are actually going. So that, that would better be translated as you're going. Okay? As you're going and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Okay? So we call this the Great Commission. This is the last directive that Jesus laid out for the church before he left. Well, Pastor, it says it was only the 11. Okay, that relieves a load off of me because then the entire book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Corinthians, I can get rid of all those because that was for those people. Well, let's, let's look a little further into his word because in Romans chapter 10... Verse 14, Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit. So Romans 10, starting in verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, now do you get this? Paul is addressing a number of questions to those who profess the name of Christ and our task to bring the gospel to those who do not profess the name of Christ. Okay? So the first thing he says is, well, how can they call on him if they, they don't believe in him? Well, how are they then going to believe in him if they've never heard? Do you know, uh, I heard a statistic a couple weeks ago. Now, statistics... They come and go. This one I, I really believe, if anything, is probably under in its accuracy, not over. But it said that approximately 90% of Christian believers will never lead someone to the Lord. Think about that for a minute. So we have, what, maybe 65 people in here? Of that 65 people, that, that means that there's like 59 or 60 of you that have never led someone to the Lord. Now, I'm hoping, I'm praying, actually I, I pray every day that that's not true in this church. My prayer every day is that God would make this a place where goats come in the door and he miraculously changes them into sheep and they go out. Okay, That's my prayer for this place. I don't want us to be a closed group. That we come in and it's a mutual admiration society. We pat each other on the back and tell each other how great we are and go out in the world and never having changed or been affected. Okay. So how can they believe in him if they've never heard? And how are they going to hear unless someone preaches? Oh, that's your job, preacher. Thank you for that. I'm so glad that you've reinterpreted God's word to fit me. Now, I'm going to reinterpret God's word and, and actually lay out what Paul is saying, because who is Paul writing to here? Christians. Those professing the name of Christ. So if you are one of those, he's speaking to you as well as me. Do you get that? See, see, when you come to Christ, you lay down your life and take up his. 
So the model by which you live your life is Christ. That's, that's what directs how you do and act and are. Okay? Christ. Okay? So, how are they going to believe unless they hear? How are they going to hear without someone preaching? And how is somebody going to preach unless they're sent? Guess what? Go. Right now, I am telling you, go. Not because of any authority that I have, but because of the authority of this. Go. Go where? Well, go about your life, but preach the word. Quit letting your actions define your Christianity. Allow the words coming out of your mouth to prove your actions true. Preach the word. Witness. Share what God has done for you. Share what God has done in your life. Know this so you can share this with someone that needs this. Look, folks, we do not memorize this nearly enough. <coughs> We have lost the sense of discipline whereby we take passages of Scripture and read them to memorization. I, I don't want to cut down the guidepost. I think they're an incredible thing for what they are. But we have adopted a guidepost mentality whereby we take a little snippet and make ourselves comfortable with it. Okay? Guidepost is not God's Word. God's Word is God's Word. This is what He's given. Okay? This is where we need to devote our time, our energy, our brain power. Now, some of you have greater difficulty memorizing. I mean, I used to be able to memorize stuff like you wouldn't believe. Now sometimes I read a passage and I can't remember what it was at the start when I started. And I've got to go back up to see why he said that. Because at the end, he tells me there's a therefore. Now, wait a minute. Why is that there? I've got to go back up and read again. I think the older we get, the more cluttered our minds get. That just means we need to develop that discipline better early on. Those of you that are young, develop the discipline now. Those that are older, hey look, I know, I understand that life happens. We can't be in our noses in this book all day long because then you're not preaching to anybody. But I'll tell you what, get the Bible on tape, MP3, whatever you have for your listening thing. Put it in as you're driving. Listen to it. Let it soak into you. Play it in your house. I'm not cutting down any of the music that you guys listen to, although if some of you told me the music you listen to, I might cut it down. Okay? I know Ben listens to country. Amen. Amen. I heard two very weak amen. I'm not, I'm not, because there are a lot of people like at our house, it is probably 99% worship music. Okay? But there's a place and a time for worship music. There's a place and a time for this. Okay? Make a discipline. Don't just read your couple verses a day and go on about your life. Make a discipline. Read it. Study it. Start making connections. From Genesis to Revelation, this thing builds upon itself. Layer upon layer. Precept upon precept. Okay? Because it's all divinely inspired of God. It's all God's mind. So study it. Know it. Memorize it. And then when those times people come up and they ask you something, you got a scripture ready to hand. You don't even have to trust in your own words. Trust in God's. Okay? So put your shoes on. Let's back up a couple verses because I told you to put, remember, put your mental finger on a verse. Let's go back up. I want to hit that again real quick. That's right. Back up in verse 11. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand. Verse 13. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. But when you're standing, 
Take off your slippers. Take off your tennies. Take off your loafers. Put on the preparation that comes from the gospel so that you can stand firm. You guys want to be wimps in Christ? No. You want to be people that are easily knocked over? You want to be people that have no power, no authority? You're, you're blown and tossed by the waves? When trouble comes on you, you're knocked over? Or do you want to be people that God can use as mighty men and women in his army? Do you want to burn brightly for Christ? Or are you okay with the bushel over your life? Are you content with having never preached the word? With having never witnessed? Without ever having put it out there? Have you made your declaration known? By your silence have you denied the Father and the Son. Because if you deny Him, He will deny you. Okay? This is not a option, folks. This is not something that you can take or leave. This is a directive. It's a commission. It's a command. By the one who has authority to give it. Jesus says, go, make disciples. Just don't worry about what you're going to say. I'm going to give you the words to say. You wouldn't believe the number of times that somebody starts talking to me and I go, oh, God, help. I don't know what to say to them. I have nothing to say. And, I, man, I'm praying desperately. You know, outside I'll be going, okay, okay, okay. And so I'm going, God, help! Speak to this person. And then God drops something into me. Okay, God, I don't want to say, say that. that. That's going to sound more weird. Um, I'm not sure that's what they really need. Okay, Glenn, give it your best shot. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, you brought me to this place. You've got to take me out. He will give you what you need. Remember, remember, remember. God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Amen. Okay? He will give you what you need. Put those shoes on. Stand firm. Let your life be a testimony, but let your mouth speak forth the gospel. Preach the word. Be faithful in preaching the word. Take a stand and stand firm. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, that you have given unto us might and power far beyond our own. Father, you have given unto us armor that you have set in place to protect us, to wage this war on a battlefield that is far beyond us. We thank you, Father, that when we come to you, when we humble ourselves before you, you lift us up. I thank you, Father, that you have promised you would never, ever leave me. You would never forsake me. I thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit that seal of our salvation. Father, you have gifted us with everything we need to accomplish your purposes. This I ask, Father, even as Paul asked, make us bold that we would preach the gospel as we ought. Strengthen your people, Father. We're not testifying to our own goodness or greatness. 
We are testifying to yours. We bless you today, Father. We honor you. And we thank you in Jesus' name.